Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me at the back? Um, I do like this very high-tech laptop that, that you've given me here, which is going to have a lot of use this evening as a disguise for the piece of paper <laughs> that I'm going to hide behind it so that you'll think this is very interactive. There's nothing happening there, it's just me, so uh, get used to that. Um, uh, thank you very, very much, Sue. Thank you to, to everyone for asking me to do this at RTS. Uh, special thanks, by the way, to Focal, uh, who uh, could not be better people to begin this, this journey with. Focal, I, I think, they're, they're a funny, unique position in the TV industry. They're the, the sort of expert treasure hunters. They know absolutely where the buried treasure of television or, or moving imagery uh, uh, lies. Um, they're also, let's face it, the alchemists who are quite good at tracking down, shall we say, undistinguished bits of broadcast output and somehow turning them into gold. Uh, uh, and in my experience, uh, if you have a great archive specialist on a television programme, you are two-thirds of the way there, often to a great documentary. No one exemplifies that more than Jane. Uh, I never worked with her myself, but my God, working with Jane, uh, as Sue says, on The Late Show, um, the admiration we had for the work that she and her teams were doing, particularly in that Clive James unit, they set a benchmark not just for tracking material down, but for really working it hard for being witty about it, about finding the humour, the meaning, the double layers uh, in back catalogue content. So, a great icon to, uh, uh, to, to kick off this great series of lectures. Very, very relevant to what we're trying to do here, because I believe one of her great passions um, was for education in the industry, particularly about handing down awareness, understanding of the past of these media onto future generations, getting that unbroken thread. And that's one of the big threads uh, of what we're trying to do with this, um, with this project. Um, so a little bit about my journey uh, into this. Uh, Sue's embarrassingly given a, a flavour of, of what I've done in life. Uh, suffice to say, I got the... Um, the archive bug early in my life at the BBC. I was in the arts department, uh, as, you, as you've heard, and I recall many long afternoons in viewing rooms deep in the bowels of Kensington House then, um, pretending to be hunting out relevant material um, for arts documentaries or my boss's needs or whatever it was, but really just getting lost in the astonishing ability to summon up material uh, explore programmes from the past, spool back and forth through, laugh at it sometimes, find it quaint, find it ridiculous, occasionally gasp with admiration uh, at what was there. Um, very, very relevant, of course, to what we were doing in the arts department because you always had a sense of, of, the, of the, the long-lasting character of the best programmes in, uh, in that bit of the industry. But above all then, I've got a feeling probably in my early 20s, which has never, ever deserted me uh, as a professional inside the BBC, of very, very privileged access. Um, that bizarre thing that just because you've got one of these staff cards, you can kind of ring up Sue or, or, or Adam Lee in the archives now uh, and be able to search, to browse, as we say now, to explore this incredible universe. And to be blunt, it's kind of unfair. Uh, it was inevitable then because we lived in the media that we did. But, but these were programmes that the public had, had invested in, had paid for. Uh, they were part of our, our shared heritage. Um, but only as professionals could we really, really explore them. So, I mean, we loved the privilege access, but it was something special. Um, uh, brief flash forward for my career to, uh, uh, to UK TV, which Sue mentioned there, which for those of you who don't know, were the BBC's commercial archive channels. And in a way, they were phase one of us as an organisation using what we could then, the, the, the grammar of multi-channel television, to start building good, really great, lively, uh, uh, well-editorialised TV channels that bring archive back to life, that give it a lease of life, that of course reward you know, BBC and, and contributors, but, but crucially keep the lifespan and the conversation of television going beyond that throwaway moment of, uh, of first broadcast. Um, it's nice to see UK TV colleagues here tonight, so there's a kind of a, another web of connections here. But even that could only take you so far. That was the, the landlocked 20th century linear constrained world of traditional television, albeit in a multi-channel frame. Flash forward to where we are now, 
the early 20th century, and suddenly all bets really are off. The broadband universe is maturing on a daily basis. Uh, IP, internet protocol, distribution is becoming an accepted part of millions of people's lives. Uh, we're not quite at the sort of Korean levels of uptake, but nonetheless, Britain is pretty fast on the uptake uh, um, to, for audiences expecting fast broadband connections. Um, and if the Digital Britain manifesto gets anywhere, that's only going to accelerate over the next few years. And one of the phenomena of this era is an explosion of on-demand access to deep back catalogue content in all sorts of creative industries other than television. <laughs> um, in music, I've, I've just discovered the, the service Spotify, for instance, a remarkable use of streamed uh, online media uh, to, to give a service which brings past and present seamlessly together. You can explore literally today's album releases alongside the most obscure jazz music from the 50s. Uh, in books, Google's innovative deal with the publishing industry, beginning, after a tense beginning, to unlock the, the, the riches of literature, whether, frankly, in print or out of print. Uh, in film, services like Love Film, traditionally, uh, uh, and others, uh, um, satisfying people's desire in that industry uh, to, to surf the past and explore the past. Not to mention, of course, the huge black economy, the illegal world of peer-to-peer, -peer, um, the appetite that you're seeing audiences have to find exactly what they want from the deep past or the recent past or the near past or the obscure byways of culture seems to be growing and growing and growing. This is a real challenge for broadcasters because we've grown up with that sense of overnight showbiz, the great thing, what's on tonight? Is it on tonight? Did you see it last night? That's a huge privilege for us. That's the great sense of entertainment and event and excitement. I know from running channels, nothing is better than that sense of moment and occasion that broadcast brings. But we're not wired up, either mentally or in terms of our structures or right structures, or even to a degree our technology, to add the other part of the equation. Uh, very interesting to see how other, for instance, broadcasters around the world are beginning to respond to this phenomenon. Uh, uh, I won't list them all, but I mean, I'm sure some of you are aware, DR2 in Denmark, very innovative project with their Bonanza service, where they've used legislation to unlock parts of Deep Archive um, using on-demand streamed video. Uh, uh, INA in France, somewhat separate from the broadcasters, complex mix of pay and free models there, but nonetheless, huge sense of privilege even for us going there. You, you can watch a news broadcast from any day for the last, I think, 35 years, straight, globally streamed on the, 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 the INA site. PBS in America struggling somewhat to get the funding to unlock what, the, what they feel is the patrimony of their archives. Hulu, of course, in the States, very, very fast-moving, successful intervention by the, um, the big commercial networks there, Fox and NBC, coming together, an unholy alliance, but doing well and definitely proving appetite for relatively recent archives, some deep archive um, content as well. Um, and CBC, who I was really pleased to see um, uh, honoured at the Focal Awards last year, have done slightly similar to what uh, uh, some colleagues, Julie Roboth and others in the BBC, have done smartly curated, relatively small, focused collections of archive. Um, but no one yet, I think, has found the absolutely transformatory model um, which could really live up to the promise of what we might achieve here. Um, part of the problem, of course, is sheer scale. Um, now, we've spent a few, you know, one of the things we've been doing over the last few months is uh, Tony, Aggie, who's working with me on this, has, has been on a bit of an odyssey around the BBC's own archives, because although we think we know what we have, we don't really know what we have. We're still uncovering bits uh, 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 all over the place. 26 locations all across uh, 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 the UK. We think around half a million hours of, of um, television, an equivalent amount of radio, half a million hours of, of, of radio. In terms of pieces or items of film and video, some three and a half million, I think, Adam, at the last count, growing all the time. Um, and that's just the programmes. In a way, the, it's about so much more than the programmes, this challenge and this opportunity. Um, there's a whole other archive of the BBC, the archives almost of the BBC itself as a cultural organisation, a business uh, over the years.